Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, new webinar. My name is Francesco M. I'm speaking from my office in Rome. And as always, before starting, I remind you that your microphones are turned off, but that during and after the webinar, you can send your question through the GoToWebinar application that appears on your screen. I will ask your question at the end of the presentation. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes, and then we will have uh, roughly 15 minutes available for questions. Our speaker today is Professor Nicole van der Kar. Nicole is a pediatric nephrologist at the Amalia Children's Hospital that is part of the uh, Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and she is a professor in complement mediated disorders in the same university. Her main research interests are in complement mediated renal diseases, in particular in C3 glomerulopathy and hemolytic uremic syndrome. She is the chair of the Dutch Typical HUS Working Group. Um, she's also the project leader of the CURE IHUS study. Um, and she is the chair of the TMA ERCNET Working Group and the International Steering Committee, and the chair of the International Steering Committee of Symposia on VTEC and STEC infection. And speaking of STEC infection, the title of her lecture today is STEC Associated HUS. Please, Nicole. Thank you, Francesco, for, for this nice introduction. Um, let me see. Uh, I hope you all can see the screen. Um, um, well, um, I cannot see you, but good afternoon, everybody. Oops, I will move forward, but that doesn't move forward. Oops. I need, probably need some help now. Hmm. Um, why don't you try the arrow? at the at the bottom left of your screen you see those yeah. arrows yeah i can see them yeah yeah. Just that. yeah it works thank you francesco well to start all it's already 40 years ago that the first link of between the bacteria the shikatoxin producing e coli bacteria and hemolytic urine syndrome um, was found this was found by dr kamali in canada who observed that out of the stools of 15 HUS patients, he found these Aztec bacteria in eight. So this was quite uh, some, um, some finding because before we didn't know what was the cause of HUS caused by diarrhea. Then the next slide here, I want to start off with some nomenclature because in the early literature, if you go and look for Aztec, you will not find it. You will find VTEC, so virocytotoxin producing E. coli. And it has two toxins, virocytotoxin 1 and virocytotoxin 2. And this is due, this name is due to the effect on vero cells, the toxic effect on vero cells where this uh, bacteria was first identified. Later on, and this is more commonly used now, we use the term shigatoxin producing E. coli, and then we we talk about shigatoxin 1 and shigatoxin 2. And um, if an Aztec bacteria causes disease in humans, and mostly that's bloody diarrhea, then we, call, we speak of enterohemorrhagic E. coli. And you can see that I wrote that typical AGS, but I, 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 I skipped it and, and because that was old, an old term, an old name for AGS with mostly bloody diarrhea. And we all know that there are more forms of HUS, more etiologies who also can present with diarrhea or having diarrhea. So now we speak nowadays about Aztec HUS. So Aztec HUS caused by an Aztec infection. And enterohemorrhagic E. coli, so Aztec causing disease in humans, is, a family, is part of a family of six pathogenic E. coli. We all know the enterotoxic E. coli who gives us travel diarrhea over here. We might know the enteropathogenic E. coli, often very young ones, causing profound diarrhea. And there you have the enteroagative E. coli, which, which is very sticky and in, in, in human uh, immun, immunocompromised people. And um, so the enterohemolytic E. coli is, um, is, has, um, well, all of these six families have their own virulence factors. And it's quite clear that the shigatoxin. Um, is, is, is the virulence factor which is in, 
found in enterohemorrhagic coli. Oh. Let me go to the next one. Some epidemiology. But first, I would like to know my audience a little bit. So I will, would like to ask you, how many spec AUS patients have you treated in the last 10 years? It's less than five, less than 10, less than 20, or more than 20. So 20 means two in every year. So I hope you can see the poll. I, can, I cannot see it, but I, I, I'm confident on the system, of course, and see what's happening. Uh, um, Nicole, I'm sorry, but this question is not included. The first I have is how many children with sex infections will develop HUS? So we need mm. to see. Well, then we skip this one. And then we go right to where is the source, the reservoir of this stack bacteria. And you can see here a lot of animals. And I think the most animal which is quoted for being a reservoir of stack infections is the, cat, the cattle, the cow. And then you can see uh, there are other domestic animals like pigs, like sheep, like goats. And also wildlife animals can, can carry with them the Aztec bacteria. Those animals don't get sick, except the pig, but the other ones don't get sick of this bacteria and just carry them as a domestic pathogen in their guts. Even birds have been shown to transfer Aztec bacteria. And we, of course, can get infected by these animals, by fecal contamination of these animals, or by human-to-human -human, um, contact. And up to now, still we find um, outbreaks. And um, it can be in, in meat, it can be in, 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 in salads, it can be in water. And we, up to now, can say that 85% of our Aztec infections in humans are foodborne. And Food Safety News is an international alert on food uh, safety issues, other, also other than, um, than Aztec infections. Here you have a nice graph. Um, and, and I think it illustrates that still we have outbreaks of Aztec infections. This is a graph of the, the monthly report from the, in the US. Um, and you can see it, it says Salmonella, Stec, and Listeria. Uh, Listeria. And the, yeah, the middle brown one is the one with Aztec infections. And every week, there are more than one outbreaks in the United States. And if we look then, what is the cause of the, the, the vehicle which causes this the Aztec infection in humans, it's nowadays in the United States, not more the hamburger, like the old fashioned hamburger disease, we call it, but backed salad. Um, and that's uh, often um, nowadays being found. If we then go to Europe and we look to the European Disease Control Center, then we see and this is a report of 2019, that from uh, the infections we got from animals, like the, we call them zoonoses, that Aztec infections are already for a long time at the third place. Uh, Campylobacter and Salmonella are one and two, but Aztec is really a fixed third place in, 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 in Europe. And you only need a minimum effective do uh, a minimum dose of 10 to 100 organisms to get infected and to get it. And important to know is that this bacteria, this Aztec bacteria, is non-invasive. When you consume this bacteria, either by food, uh, but mostly by food, then this bacteria has to pass a lot of difficulties in the human gut. But this is a very tough bacteria who can really stand the acidic pH in the gut, who can handle bile salts and sometimes even get more uh, stack production by, um, by bile salts, and who can, hand, and who can with, with the environment in the gut, either get more stack of more shigatoxin production or less. And then it comes in the colon, and then it gets really sticky to this colon and can cause disease. And if you then see, um, there are many types of Aztec bacteria. We have we call them serotypes. And you can here see on the right corner an example what is what means serotype. 
serotype means that we we can define on, on, on how, it how it's built up the lipopolysaccharide of the bacteria of this gram negative bacteria we call it the o type and then you can really type them very well with sugar contents and which uh, different sugar contents they have and give them a number so this is done for a lot of bacteria and also for this for aztec and then you see in this big cohort of, of uh, uh, Alconcher um, 280 patients, Argentinian cohort, which they looked for the serotype and the, the, the which toxin it's produced in a cohort of Aztec AUS patients, mostly all, all children. And then you can see the most prominent one is serotype 0157 and H7, the H is the flagell. And um, if you then look, see for the virulence genes, the shikatoxin genes, then mostly this O157 has STX2, which is the most profound shikatoxin in Aztec AUS, and also the one which makes you more sick than shikatoxin 1. You can find bacteria who produce 1 and 2, uh, and they can also give AUS, and very rarely, and shikatoxin 1 can lead to AUS. Those, those serotypes who lead to AGS have also virulence factors, which you can look for with certain techniques. And you have the adherence uh, virulence factors here, the EAE gene and the enterhemolysin gene. Besides O157, there are more serotypes uh, present and, and causing disease in humans. And we call them the big five. And in, in lots of countries, still the big five is there. So it's 0157, 0145, and 0026, for example, who can be found in patients with Aztec AUS. Wh who gets ill? And who is this patient with Stec AUS? And for this, I would like to demonstrate you a cohort of Italy, of uh, Gian Luigi Adesino, who has for 10 years um, um, examined in his pediatric cohort. He sampled every patient with AGS. It could be Aztec AGS or it could be atypical AGS. And he found in 10 years 89 patients with Aztec AGS and 12 cases of atypical AGS. And you can see the median age where these patients occur is a little bit the same, and it's below five years of age. This can make it very difficult for a clinician to discriminate if there is slightly some diarrhea, if it's an Aztec AUS or an atypical AUS. And the, this profile of age, which he shows here, is also what we can see for the majority of Aztec AUS cohorts. So it's below five years of age. And we, and also he, his group, could demonstrate that if you look in the household members, let's say the siblings, the mothers and the fathers and the grandparents or caretakers, you find in, a, in, in the index AUS case that there is almost 40% of prevalence of this Aztec bacteria seen, found in, in, in household members. Mostly it's the siblings and, and, and mothers but also fathers and grandparents can carry and have this bacteria with mild or even asymptomatic or even also some bloody diarrhea. So it's, it can be very helpful to, to uh, take a feature sample, stool sample also from family members to be sure if you have an Aztec AUS. These were children, but does Aztec AUS occur also in adults? Um, and I think we all, I think the majority of the audience knows that in 2011 in Europe, we had this huge outbreak where almost more, more than 800 age um, US cases were found caused by the serotype 0104, H4, and this is predominantly in adults. Um, and so it, it can occur in adults. It can be this 0104, which was in the outbreak outbreak, but also serotype 0157 can occur in adults. And the, the intriguing part of this uh, outbreak was that it was, and I, I take you to the right here, it was this enteroagative E. coli family, uh, semi-strain, who took this shigatoxin bacteriophage into 
his uh, DNA, that's his, his bacterial DNA, and was able to produce now his own virulence factor, but also the shigatoxin. And he was therefore very sticky and, and occurred probably in adults for the, by this reason, and okay, gave HRS because the shigatoxin was now uh, part of his uh, virulence factors. So by going from a contamination with E. coli, an Aztec infection, going to Aztec HRS in children, we can have various periods. You can, you know, first, you, of course, you have to get the, the bacteria by oral ingestion, and it takes you three to five, sometimes even to 10 days to get sick. And then it's 80 to 90% who develop some kind of diarrhea. A, a, a less part, let's say 50%, will move on to bloody diarrhea, even sometimes severe, we call it hemorrhagic colitis. And then 10 to 50% will move on to develop HUS. And then the sequelae after having HUS is reported, it says here, 30 to 50%, but it depends on which states, uh, um, which period after HUS you look for sequelae. But you can see that there's always spontaneous recovery in between as well. And until now, I think for all these years, we know of Aztec HUS, we are aware that Argentina has the highest annual incidence of Aztec HUS. And in Italy, in Europe, it's like, let's, let's say it's 10.4 in 100,000 children below five years of age. And it's from 1.5 to 1.8 in Italy and France and Germany. And in the northern Scandinavian countries, it's, it's, it's less. So the symptoms of Aztec HUS presentation, I think the majority of my audience will know them. Though those are mostly previous healthy children the majority has an age below five years of age. You can have a seasonal variation. I think that's, um, that it's mostly in, in the summertime. It, it's from August or, or after summer till October. But I don't know what climate change will do in, in the future. And mostly male and female are equally affected. It presents with vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, the majority, watery, often bloody. But keep in mind, that, however, somebody has the microphone on, so I would, I can hear. But um, I can, in 10% of the Aztec HUS patients, there is no diarrhea at presentation, and that's really something to keep in mind. Children get very suddenly pale, even uh, jaundice, and, um, and it, important is that you hardly see fever in the Aztec HUS cases. You can see pitechia and echimosis, and you can see some neurology factors in 20 to 30 percent of our patients, restless, irritable, even somnolence and, and even convulsions. And patients can uh, present, of course, with oluria and anuria, often sometimes difficult uh, to, uh, to establish, to see for parents when you have a, a child be below five years of age with diarrhea. The really, really severe ones who are really um, 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 well, not, not common, fortunately, can also have pancreatic involvement during their first uh, days and weeks and, give an, and get at, at, the, at the end the diabetes mellitus or can have a cardiomyopathy. Okay. Well, then important is how we can detect our stack infection. And then this is an important slide. This is really important because we as pediat pediatricians and pediatric nephrologists and also as adult nephrologists, we have to decide what is the cause of to find out what is the cause of HUS. And very, very often there is no stool of immediately available when the child comes to the emergency department and to the clinic. And then you can either wait for the stool, but it can take days. And this is something you absolutely don't have to do. You use a rectal swab when you, there's no stool immediately available. And you have to talk to your microbiology department to that they take and handle their rectal swabs and diagnose them and, and test them if they contain Aztec, yes or no. And this is a very elegant study from Stephen Friedman from Canada, who, who, who really used this rectal swab not only for Stec, but also for other anthropogenic uh, detection in children. And I really think this is something we should do because it, it, it's, it takes no time and it's really helpful to make the diagnosis stack. Well, nowadays 
when you have your rectal swab or you are you your luck or you have your stool specimen or you can take a stool specimen from the household member then the majority of the labs nowadays i think but you can correct me at the end i'm wrong use molecular diagnostic techniques they use pcr and then look if the shigatoxin 1 or and shigatoxin 2 are present in this stool it can be negative um, and then there's no stool available but keep in mind that you only took a sample um, which can be tiny so in our hospital we always take three samples in a certain time period to really and say if, if there's a stack negative yes or no this pcr is often uh, combined with the eae gene uh, virulence factor and then you are more sure that you ha you have here a pathogenic aztec um, serotype and those techniques nowadays are also used to define the serial group of course, you can also culture with a specific, um, a specific uh, culture broth and then look for the, uh, the certain serotypes. This slide is to, to show you that there is the possibility to add um, uh, serology to your detection methods. And you can see here, this is a study of our own lab. If you from 65 patients with who have an Aztec AUS of whom we had stool and serum available with the fecal diagnostics, we had a yield of 45%, 54%, sorry, of Aztec um, AUS. But if we looked only for the LPS based 0157, so the most prominent one still in the Netherlands, uh, Aztec serotype, then we found this that this serology was even more positive than the fecal diagnostics and if you combine them you get a higher yield of Aztec um, positive uh, patients and if you combine it with other non-0157 ELISAs you can even make it higher and those serology an analysis is performed mostly in one or two centers in the, in the country because it's of course a rare disease and not always uh, not every lab has to do have to do this this is a very recent study from one month ago and i thought it might be of value of those colleagues who are now in the audience who see um, children who have a, who have bloody diarrhea and when and when anthropathogenic um, detection methods are um, being performed then it turns out that they are shigatoxin positive and what then what is the chance that they develop AGS and is this, uh, can we pick out the child who really has um, a serious problem developing AGS? Well, the group of artists, artists you know, with, um, investigated um, 100 uh, uh, patients who had, were, uh, had bloody diarrhea and who were shikotoxin positive in the, in the 10 year period. Of those 100, 63 had only bloody diarrhea when they came in in their emergency department, and 37 came in and they already had a full blown um, AUS. Those where the full blown AUS had erythrocytes or hemoglobinuria positive in their, in their urine. And he used this tool to uh, examine the cohort of bloody diarrhea and he took every day, sometimes even twice a day, a dipstick and measured if there was um, uh, hemoglobinuria, erythrocyturia in those patients. And if nothing developed, the patient did not develop AGS. But those who were positive with erythrocytes in the urine, uh, and we and he, he went further with lab results, and you can see it here in the algorithm, then there were 15 of 22 who really developed AGS. And he made a nice algorithm where he stated, um, look for when you find a shigatoxin positive in a bloody diarrhea stool, then if it's shigatoxin one, which is mostly less harm, harmless, less harm for the patient, then try look again, because maybe you missed shigatoxin two. And when you have shigatoxin two, or you find both, then use your urine dipstick and find the ones who, um, who will develop Aztec AGS. And very importantly, he also treated them already with, with rehydration fluids, which is, I'll come back to you later. Then I've got a case presentation there, and I hope really now that uh, the poll works. 
this is, is a real case which came to our department. It's a 16 month boy. He was previously healthy, but he had uh, some vomiting, some nausea. And uh, then he went to the emergency department in the evening because he was a fluctuating level of alertness and he developed petechia on his lower limbs. Um, I think, uh, let me see. Yeah, he was then uh, because of um, he had no fever. He had um, and because of his neurological symptoms, and he was uh, went to the emergency, to the intensive care unit, and then blood examination uh, turned out he had a thrombotic myopathy, so hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and he had acute renal failure. So now I would like to ask my audience, what do you think? Uh, is it mostly li likely Aztec AUS about what you heard from me? Is it atypical? It can be STEC, but it can be atypical, or can it be Trumpo TTP? Ah, now it works. Maybe I can vote myself. Uh -huh. I will wait. I hope, Francesco, you have already some results. Can you see ah, them? Yes, I can see them. Okay. And I'm really, um, uh, of course, people think it must be an Aztec because this talk is about Aztec AUS. But I think with the, with the, with, which is the information I've given you, I think the majority is right. Okay, then we move on. Oops, oh, well, now was my presentation gone. Um, yep. Uh, would you then, with the information I gave you, uh, give a clism up? You can see, yes, it's atypical AGS. Yes, but further diagnostics might be needed. No, I'm sure it's an Aztec. No, I need plasma therapy. And eclizumab is not available. Because eclizumab is not available. I wonder if there are some results. Yes, um, the majority has answered yes, but further diagnostics are needed. It's 63%. Uh, there is still 16% who said, oh, I will give plasma therapy because eclizumab, probably because eclizumab is not available. And 11% uh, say with the information I gave, it's, it's uh, either atypical or they answered Aztec AUS. Well, we will see what, what happens in this case. Oops, I see myself now. So let's go to the presentation. Um, well, this case had a thrombotic myopathy, hemolytic anemia, and the, the platelet counts were low. There was clearly a low hemoglobin level. He had neurological symptoms, he had convulsions, and he was anuric, but he didn't have really gastrointestinal symptoms. So, epidemiological scene, the majority can be an Aztec AUS, it can be atypical A1 AUS, or it can be TTP. And for that, we need our diagnostic assays. We perform, we can perform Adams 13 activity, which is when it's below. 10% will exclude, uh, will, will say it's TTP, and we can perform our shigatoxin uh, uh, stack um, diagnostics to uh, see if it's an Aztec AUS. Unfortunately, we cannot have not a diagnostic assay immediately available which says, which says it's atypical AUS. So what happened in this case was that uh, indeed the Adams 13 was very quick and it was less, it was uh, for more than 40%, so it was not a TTP. So it left us with um, atypical and Aztec AUS and we didn't have um, the Aztec results uh, quick available. So we, we had an emerg in the intensive care unit a patient which could be both, which could have atypical or Aztec AUS. So we gave him indeed one uh, shot of eclizumab intravenously and uh, then went further with our diagnostics. And here you can see what we did as diagnostics. I mean, uh, we looked for the complement, we looked for anti antibodies, we did DNA, 
and there were no complement later on, I mean weeks later, there were no complement abnormalities in the DNA. But the features, and I think it was a rectal swab, came out that there was, an, there was Chicotoxin 2, and it was an EAE gene positive uh, found in these features. So it should have been an Aztec HUS. And um, our serology, didn't, which then was 0157 and uh, 026, it was negative. But when we send it to Groningen, uh, where we have a specialized lab in the Netherlands for looking for molecular serotyping, it turned out to be an O18HH2. And this is really a strange pathogen, but not that strange anymore. And for that, I want to alert you that it's it's now an emerging pathogen serotype, which is seen uh, in f more in France. I mean, they have to be, I mean the biggest reports, and you can see it's even just as big as O157. And it's, you can find it through the years um, in, this, um, in this group. But the, it has this Shigotoxin 2, well, a toxin. It has this EAE um, adhesion um, uh, virulence factor. And it has a plasmid, which makes them far more resistant to antibiotics. And it, can also, and it has shown to be an invasive. And that is strange if I told you before that Aztec mostly are non-invasive bacteria. And the source still is not known. The pathogenesis, briefly, um, the, this is an epithelial cell. This is the bacteria which comes, uh, which may, might find themselves intimate with the epithelial cell. The sugatoxin guy can either go through the cell or paracellular and come into the bloodstream. I think more ways can be open, and we are not sure yet. And then it needs to find its receptor, GB3. GB3 is on every cell except the erythrocytes, and so and on every cell. So this toxin needs this uh, receptor to enter the cell, and by doing it, it will go um, find itself the way to the endoplasmatic reticulum and then inhibit uh, the protein synthesis. We know that endothelial cells can have this GB3, but can also be upregulated uh, by uh, cytokines like tumor mucosa factor alpha. So more GB3 is on the cell surface, which makes them more vulnerable. And then if you look for blood growth and ethereal cells, also from Aztec HUS patients, then you can see that also here the cytokines can make these endothelial cells more vulnerable for the toxin. You need the shigatoxin and its receptor to, uh, to develop stack HUS. And I think the group of Diana Karpman really beautiful shows that there are blood cell derived microvesicles who contain shigatoxin and can deliver this shigatoxin also to the kidney of the, atypical, of, of the AGS patients. And I think there's far more about the pathogenesis, but, but it's too complicated now and to explain in just a couple of minutes. The treatment. What can we do? Can we treat this patient? There was in the past shigat antibodies against shigatoxin. There was um, um, compounds who can uh, who look like this receptor GB3, but none of these really did something with um, well for the treatment of Aztec HUS patients. I think the best treatment which we still have was already 60 years ago. When I can show you here Carlos Gian Antonio, a famous Arti um, a pediatric nephrologist from Argentina already in 1962, remind you, um, uh, saw a lot of patients with bloody diarrhea and acute renal failure, and he managed them to do perform peritoneal dialysis. I think this was the main major advantage for treatment still in Aztec HUS. But we have a glizumab. And in 2011, there was a report in New England Journal of Medicine of three very young uh, Aztec HUS patients with severe neurology symptoms as well, where the authors um, um, used uh, plasmapheresis and also decided then because of this severity of the disease to use uh, eclizumab. And they uh, uh, showed and the, demonstrated in their uh, paper that those patients went well. There were criticals. There are criticism in our pediatric nephrology field because if you, there were patients who said, of the doctors who said, but the, the platelets already went up before you give eclizumab. So maybe it's already, there was already a natural process of, of getting better. So that was still a question. But is complement activated in Aztec HUS? 
Yes, it is. It's of course in the bacteria and our complement has to act on it. And you can see it by all these, this is a, a, a part of the publication who have shown indeed that the complement system is activated in Aztec AGS patients uh, on the same amount you can find in atypical AGS patients. Eclizumab then and plasma exchange was used in this great, uh, in this big German outbreak. And this could show that there was no evidence that plasma freeze of eclizumab was of um, any, any big benefit. I mean, if you can see the neurological symptoms, it was a basic best su uh, support. It was the patients on plasma freeze, it was plasma freeze and eclizumab. And it was then the second bar is the one uh, at follow up. And you can see that uh, there was no difference, no real difference uh, as compared with best supportive care. Are then complement gene variants also seen, like we see in atypical AGS, are they seen in aesthetic AGS patients? And this was beautifully studied in, and published in 2019 by the French group of Veronique uh, Fremobachi, who really showed in a cohort of 108 aesthetic AGS patients, and they could look for for the complement genes that only three out of 75 had a pathogenic variant as compared to the controls. And she found some minor variants um, in 12 patients out of 75. And those were not the severe ones who had this pathogenic variants. So she said there is, there is only very rarely a complement DNA abnormality in Aztec AGS patients. We definitely need to wait for um, proper randomized trial and hopefully some results on the ECOSTEC trial and the ECOLICIO trial in France will help us in that way. So the treatment at this time now is still only symptomatic. And I think timely rehydration intravenously is, has become uh, in the last years more and more important. You find here on the bottom, various publications who and one a meta analysis over here who has shown that timely hydration in Aztec AGS patients really is of importance and recently the group of Argentina by led by Dr Bonani has shown that if you have volume expansion already in the first days then uh, and you treat your patient like that you can prevent them from going to dialysis um, there, of course, you need blood transfusions uh, one, um, in, in, in quite some, some patients, and please not much uh, platelet transfusions only if needed. Antibiotics, still we say no, because uh, there are results, often in vitro results, who say that antibiotics can um, release more shigatoxin. And the mortality has come down to 1 to 4% due to the, the possibility to dialysis young patients. But still we see 20-30% uh, long-term sequelae. And I think you can see here the outcome in Aztec patients, and this is from an Italian cohort, which is mostly more than 70-75% here in the group, in these patients from the Italian North, North Italian group. But how to follow up those patients then? This is an a German Austria cohort published in 2012, which really uh, uh, nicely demonstrated that after five years here, you have 60 out of 20, 274 patients who have one or more symptom which you can define as uh, renal sequelae, hypertension, proteinuria, uh, GFR less than 80%, and even if they were in the first year normal and were um, had no uh, were fully recovered, there is a portion of patients who really can develop a hyper hypertension and proteinuria later on. So it's important um, to follow up them yearly with blood pressure and with urine control. So then I come to my take home message, which I think is important for you to take home. It's Acute body diarrhea is never normal in children, so think of STEC and also other um, antropathogens. You perform your stool, think of the rectal swab. You can also look for serology and, and find a lab who can look for the antibodies. And if you have bloody diarrhea and not yet AGS, then you can use urine to look if there's hemoglobinuria 
and, and um, define those with hemoglobinuria if they have an, an AGS, yes or no. And start rehydration, because how higher your hematocrit level, how difficult, um, um, how more severe the renal problems can be. Think of the stool of family members, and think of that 10% of our stack AGS patients have no diarrhea as presenting symptom. And we were lucky by looking very hard um, that we found another serotype in the Netherlands now, just as is occurring now in France, this O80. And I think stack, just like any bacteria, can activate the complement system. So also in Aztec AGS, but it's not the main driver of disease. And up till now, we have no evidence for eclizumab as treatment of stack AGS. But in cases, as I've shown you, which you um, don't have the clue yet, um, it, it can be very helpful to give one dose of eclizumab. And for those who really think, um, I, uh, I want to know more, I want to know better, then we have every three year at VTEC, Aztec meeting. And this year it, it, it's, it's an online meeting and it's for free. So you can read, it, it, it contains everything you want to know about um, Aztec. So go there. And I think with that, I want to end my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm happy here to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. This was uh, a wonderful presentation. I think that um, your presentation was extremely clear and I think we were, for some of us it was a rehearsal and you always learn when you rehearse and for others it was really um, enlightening and I think we all have learned a lot. So Thank please uh, send in your questions so that I can uh, uh, um, ask them uh, for you to Nicole. Um, um, so, Dr. Morales is asking you, Nicole, how long should we wait before deciding to start treatment with a complement blocker? Uh, actually, when there is I, in my experience from the last 20, 25 years, I have never found um, a typical AGS patient who had really bloody diarrhea. Those are mostly stack AGS patients. So when you have bloody diarrhea, then look for the stack. And I don't think you can, you don't need to use an eclizumab um, or complement blocker. But there are cases like the ones I present you where there might be diarrhea, uh, but not really that profoundly, who have an age which is not really, uh, it's 11 or 7, or, um, or really have um, thrombocytes which are not profoundly as uh, deep as uh, thrombocytopenia as in stack AGS, then you, you, you can give one shot of eclizumab intravenously and make your diagnostics complete. Really look very hard to find this Aztec um, by uh, going to your microbiologist, ask for the best stool examination, look for serology, and, um, and try to, in the, in the days you have, to find out if it's an Aztec, yes or no. If, you don't have then an Aztec, then I would suggest um, uh, do, uh, do use complement uh, di uh, DNA diagnostics. It's clearly that an Aztec AGS patient has hardly or, or an, 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 an DNA pathogenic mutations. So the role for complement blockers uh, can be at the beginning when your diagnosis is not really clear. But at the end, for an Aztec AGS, I, I, well, we have to wait for the random, randomized controlled trials. But um, seeing the Germany data, I wonder if there is a, a, um, a role for complement uh, inhibitors in Aztec AGS. But future oh. will tell. All right. So now we have a, a number of questions that are coming in. So I think you can respond to most of them fairly quickly because i think you okay you, sorry you, you already have responded um in your talk to some of these but let me ask them to you so that it's sort of it, it may be a repeat but i think that it's good for everybody so what is your opinion on antibiotics for stack h2s that dr ronquist is asking you this 
Well, antibiotics have um, have no place in Aztec AUS. Um, meta analysis on for the the last 20 years have uh, seen no really a role for antibiotics. Um, some say they can make it worse. Uh, some say they may be of some help, but um, so in general, no antibiotics. But be um, be clever and look carefully to your patients, because there can also be an an an, 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 inf an other infection besides the Aztec which needs antibiotics. Because if you have a, a, a your hemodialysis line or whatever, so um, don't. Don't um, um, don't be afraid to use antibiotics for other reasons than an Aztec AUS in your patients, because when it's needed, it's needed. Okay, so Dr. Dox is actually thanking you for the presentation, and Dr. Borisova is asking you a comment on coagulation in children with Tech HUS and atypical HUS. Well, he touches. Uh, an, um, 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 a field which is uh, not really well um, um, well enlightened yet. I did some work in the past on it, but we we, we don't know yet um, much about the complement of uh, about the coagulation role uh, for treatment. I mean, in the in the years already in the past with heparin or with urokinase, for example, there was no benefit of uh, resolving clots in, 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 in TMA and Aztec AUS. But the underneath um, pathogenesis, I think coagulation really plays a role, but um, I think we, we need more research for that. But for treatment, um, there is no, there seems um, from the studies all from the past, no role for um, uh, heparin or aspirin or urokinase or fibrinolytic um, drugs. Okay, Dr. Yadav is asking you what is the role of stool culture as a screening test before toxin assay? Is it likely to result in false negative results or does it, um, is it sufficient as a screening tool in remote places? It is in remote places. I think um, stool culture, if you, ha if you have, for example, if you know in your country that 0157 is the most prominent one, then there are culture uh, plates with uh, sorbitol Mekongi agar, which will really help you to define um, your 0157 uh, serotype uh, or, and, and colony. So stool culture is in remote areas still very, very um, um, useful. You can also use those stool cultures and make a uh, fecal filtrate and and use them on virus cell cells for example and find this toxic uh, effect on cells this can also help you if you don't have this this molecular diagnostic tools so uh, and stool culture you still need to really find at the end also you do all this fancy molecular diagnostic to you really get in your hands this this um the, the really the bug the the, the the bacteria to and to which you use for epidemiological epidemiological research all right. Um, now, before I ask you the other question, I'm stopping here the questions. So, um, um, because we already have a number of questions to ask to Nicole before um, five o'clock. So, for those of you who have not sent in your question and want to ask more questions, please um, send directly your the an email to Dr. Van der Kar. So, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hugh is asking you how uh, rehydration therapy helps to prevent HOS. Well, it has to do with uh, when you are dehydrated and you have vomiting and and um, and um, your hematocrit uh, is going up and it makes your erythrocytes sludging in the microvessels, and for that, if you're and and form clots, and if you are intervene in this process in time with um, rehydration, and in the in the in my talk, I give the reference which you really can look up, and they give really a uh, good. Um, um, yeah, 
hands out how to do it, you can prevent um, more clotting or severe clotting and more renal damage. So it's, it's, it's the hematocrit, which is very uh, important in that. And of course, you need to monitor it, but the child is in the hospital. And if you really can really um, look carefully at your fluid um, uh, balance, um, uh, which, which comes in, which comes out, it, it, it can be of help. I know it sounds strange, and it took me some years um, to really convince myself and also my colleagues to give more fluid because we're not we from we were not um, taught that way. But I think the studies um, from Argentina, from the US, uh, from um, uh, Italy have shown that uh, it's um, it's good to look at it and um, to look at your patient and to implement it. Okay, Dr. Yadav is. Um is starting your question as following. Severe neurological and cardiac manifestation are suggested to be an indication for plasma pharesis in stachyatures. So the question is, what is your opinion? And is there a consensus on the management of these complications? I suppose. This, is an, this is an important question because the neuro neurology symptoms um, at presentation and during the first days are really uh, terrifying parents and also the ones who are taking care of the child. The, um, in general, if you look through the literature through all these years, then the neurology is reversive and, and, and reversible. And although it seems uh, in the majority of patients, um, so that's good to keep in mind. The study, the German outbreak, where a lot, a lot of, AT, of AGS patients had plasma Pharesis have shown because of the, they were really also with uh, uh, severe neurological symptoms have shown that they were not better than those with best supportive care. So it um, and so for that I um, it, 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 it's 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 um, probably um, of it has the literature has shown and and the outbreaks have shown that plasma pharesis um, alone or either in 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 um, in combination with the clizumab. Uh, probably have no no good value, but I I know it's difficult when you have a patient, and uh, so then look carefully at those literature of the German outbreak and convince yourself, and and see what uh, um, what's your opinion. Yeah. Is there a role for gut microbiota dysbiosis to guess who will get HUS after a stick infection? Oh well, um, Dr. Dursun. Uh, that's, uh, that, that there are some studies, but I'm, 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 I don't remember them at the moment. But um, by uh, talking to you about the traveling of the bacteria through the gut, um, it is um, um, the, um, the, the stack already comes in contact with other um, bacteria, and of course, um, it, they can influence each other. And um, I think by the time they have an Aztec AGS, you're too late, so that uh, there is no nothing more to to intervene. Um, but to, to have a healthy gut system, uh, and that takes more than only probiotica, I think, uh, that's important for every, every people, everyone. Uh, but at, in the acute phase, I think there is no, um, no role for what I'm aware of, but correct okay. me if I'm wrong for probiotica. Okay, Dr. Malakasiotti is asking you, um, your opinion on using bacteriostatic antibiotics, which in theory can block protein synthesis, including shikatoxin in the gut. Yes, um, there are some reports um, who, 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 who use these antibiotics. Uh, I, I have no um, experience with them. I don't use antibiotics. Instead, there is another cause in the patient which needs antibiotics. Um, you have to be aware that with antibiotics, you change the environment in the gut uh, for the best or for the worst. So un unfortunately, I, I don't know. And I cannot answer it because I don't have the experience. Dr. Uh, Royas Rivera is asking you, is it possible that patients who develop sequelae over time are more likely to have chronic complement activation and underlying genetic alterations that are not detected at onset of the disease? So should we okay. further study possible complement mutation in these patients? Um, in stack HUS patients, should we, do, should we yeah. look for... Um, 
So if you have a patient that has yeah, sequelae. Well, that's, what, that's, what the, that, that's a good question. I think uh, I, I did it myself with the Dutch cohort. I couldn't find the sequelae. Um, I, uh, the French, the study which I've shown you from Fremo Bachi in, in published in, in Clinical JSON, could not establish um, that. But of, of course, it's a small the, well, it was a, a core of almost 100 patients, uh, but she couldn't find it. Um, so um, um, probably it's not there. Um, if I, I, I see the data from the past, um, it's not there. The only, so, the only thing I found, but it was my first publication, that maybe in the HLA antigen, um, there might be some um, polymorphisms. And one has found polymorphisms also in, um, in, 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 in the ACE, in, in those patients, but that's only one study. Okay, Nicole, we have five more minutes and I have five questions. So, <laughs> Oops. Um, <laughs> So, so, very quickly, is there a need to administer fresh frozen plasma to patients with HOS? No, there's no need. Okay. So, what is the best logical time to start Eculizumab? Which clinical and lab features um, um, should you suggest to start Eculizumab? Well, I think I, I, I said it already before, but in Aztec AUS um, with bloody diarrhea, um, I would not use a clismab because I think it's Aztec AUS. But those patients which you are, which have um, um, an age uh, of, of above five, or with, with the with the um, the clinical history that um, is um, a little bit um, different than from normally Aztec AUS patients, I can imagine you could give one shot of eclizumab if it's really a severely um, ill patient but uh, and then look for um, your other diagnostics and look for this Aztec but in the majority um, eclizumab is not needed I think. So my a question on the same topic by Dr. Nassi and Dr. Kwan should be um, should you give platelets in stack HUS with severe thrombocytopenia and um, how do you manage thrombocytopenia below 10,000 stake HOS patients? So I guess it's the same question. Well, platelets um, uh, below 50,000 uh, or thrombocyte or severe thrombocytopenia, when there's not um, a severe uh, a bleeding, um, um, you don't give you don't give platelet transfusion. That's the general opinion in Aztec HUS. But if you have um, a severe bleeding, of course you need to give platelets. And I'm aware there's one publication who really looked through all the years of literature and looked for thrombocyte Pina and um, found that there was no uh, really not really you do you don't do really that much damage that, that was one paper saying if you have if you give a uh, platelet transfusion um, in an acute situation so um, if your your um, surgeon by placing a catheter for starting dialysis wants to give um, platelets then um, if it's an hemodialysis uh, catheter i can imagine if it's peritoneal dialysis i i think you it depends on the surgeon but often not needed uh, but if there really is a situation um, in which it's you think um, you need platelets you do but um, Otherwise, uh, you can just uh, you just wait, and you don't give them you don't give them prophylactically, such such as we see in onc oncology patients. We don't do the, I mean that's not a standard yeah. therapy in stack AGS. Can I push you a little bit more on this one, uh, Nicole? Uh, I think we all agree that normally, if you don't have evidence of bleeding, you don't give platelets. Um, is there a threshold in a very sick child below which you would still give it? Let's say you have 5,000 platelets. Is there a number where, so there is an official saying and then there is the practical thing. Um, can I ask you, or do you really, really don't give them as long as they don't have a bleeding? Um, when there is, um, uh, you might, consider it when there's severe neurology and convulsions. Um, I can imagine that you um, you are afraid of also um, bleeding in, in the brain. Um, then I think you, you can give, of course, platelet transfusion. So if your 
your situation makes it you feel uncomfortable with uh, the low platelets because of neurology um, convulsions or because of um, um, yeah whatever bleeding um, then then you can do it um, of course I mean that's that's the, it depends on the situation but in the majority of patients it's not needed but it depends on the situation and I can imagine I yeah I was yeah. trying to interpret the question you know. Uh, but I guess that that was the the, the 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 point behind these questions. But again, as you said, the rule is not to give if you don't have bleedings, right? So the last yeah. question is from Dr. Nasi: uh, um, uh, What is the best antibiotic if you have a sepsis? Of a sepsis? Well, it depends on the the, the the what what your hospital uh, is is um, 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 saying of septic protocol that can vary, and that's mostly um, uh, gram negative as well as gram positive antibiotics, and that can be um, um, ceftriaxone in combination with with. Um, with vancomycin, for example, that um, that that depends. And um, if the, you really think there is another, uh, besides the Aztec um, AUS, there is another infection there which needs antibiotics. You definitely need to give the antibiotics, of course. Okay. So um, thank you so much. Uh, we are on time. Actually, it's 5:01, so it's time to end the webinar. Um, it was a wonderful webinar. Thank you again, Nicole. Uh, let me remind you all um, of the next webinars. Um, some of them are on similar topics. So we have acute post on May 4, TMA and antiphospholipid syndrome on May 11, and June 1st, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So please join again, and thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Nicole.